So Black people have passed as white in many ways and for many reasons. And many of you have probably read Britt ben Brett Bennett's wonderful book, The Vanishing Half. And as you might remember, Stella, a light-skinned Black woman, decided to start passing as white in the 1950s when she was 16. Stella was responding to a listing in the newspaper for uh, secretarial work in the marketing department of a department store called Maison Blanche. And she was a strong candidate for the position. She'd always received good grades for her typing. But if anybody learned she was black, she'd automatically become unfit for the position. Because at that time, um, a department store would never hire a black girl to do more than put away shoes or spray perfume. So after doing really well at the typing test and much to her surprise, Stella was offered the position. She accepts the position, as I'm sure, you know, as you may know, um, without correcting the secretary's mistaken assumption that she was white. So then once she's hired, Stella has to pretend to be white every day. She began by passing during work hours and on the bus ride to and from work. Now, during the 20th century, because of the one drop rule, anybody with known African ancestry or what was referred to as one drop of black blood was socially and legally considered black in the United States. This meant, practice meant that many mixed race people who had diverse ancestry were simply considered black. However, because many black people also had European ancestry, their light skin and light hair made it easier for them to be perceived by others as white. Stella was just one such person. So Bennett's novel was inspired by Alison Hobbs's wonderful book, Chosen Exile, which is a piece of nonfiction um, about the history of racial passing. And as Hobbes notes, there are many different types of racial passing and there are many different reasons for engaging in racial passing. While some cases of passing are lifelong, Stella's is initially, as many are, a case of what Hobbes calls nine to five or temporary passing. Stella's reasons for temporarily passing are complicated. So initially she passes as white to secure a job that's gonna pay enough for her and her twin sister, Desiree, to get by. So in other words, for economic survival. But she also passes as a way to protect herself from the trauma of racial oppression. She's haunted throughout her life by images of her father's lynching. Leon, her father, was dragged out of bed and murdered by a white mob, largely just for being a successful entrepreneur. Now, at the time, the only thing that kept Stella from screaming and being found in the closet was Desiree's hand over her mouth. And this lived trauma remains with Stella and motivates her throughout the book. So to avoid a similar death, a realistic possibility if she stayed where she was, because she was living in the American South at the time, um, Stella chooses to pass as white. Now, we also see racial passing um, come up more recently in HBO's production of Lovecraft Country um, in, in, the, in the first season, episode five, that's called Strange Case. Um, and I think this is a really lovely episode. So if you haven't seen it, I really, really recommend it. Um, but Ruby, who's a dark-skinned Black woman, um, gains the power to pass as white. And unlike Stella, Ruby doesn't initially choose to pass as white. She actually wakes up one morning and finds herself magically in a white body. And she's pretty startled at first, right? But after some time, she adjusts and she's empowered by her experience. Now, racial passing too often is linked with what is referred to as a tragic mulatto as someone who passes as white and has a tragic ending, much like Claire and Nella Larson's book, Passing. The character is often depicted as sad, torn between two worlds and is ultimately punished for passing um, through murder or suicide. What's amazing about this episode about Ruby is that her arc in the show turns this narrative on its head. Ruby is anything but tragic. She is a self-confident, self-possessed black woman, even when she's wearing white skin. So Ruby initially uses her newfound power for personal gain. Like Stella, she just secures herself a managerial position in a department store. But she slowly discovers that she can do much more than this. In fact, she can do almost anything she wants. And she ultimately decides to use her power to pursue racial justice. And she does this by exercising revenge on racists and rapists who engage in violence against Black women. So using racial passing as a way to challenge racial oppression is not only something that happens in fiction, it happens in real life too. So while traveling in Mobile, Alabama, Reverend Jesse Rute, um, that's how he pronounces his last name, decided to pass as a South Asian. He had visited Mobile before and was insulted and pushed around. And of course he wasn't happy with this treatment. So the next time he visited, he rented a turban and spoke with a slight Swedish accent. Don't ask me why. Um, but he sat on a railway passenger car and visited restaurants in Mobile. 
And he said that after this, he was treated as a visiting dignitary and he was treated with courtesy and respect everywhere he went. So why did he decide to pass as a South Asian? Well, according to his own testimony, he says in part, he did it to learn something about American racism. He also says that he, you know, we know that he talked with the New York Times and in doing so, he sought to make a political statement and to teach others about what he learned. As his son, Luther Rute said in an interview with NPR, he didn't change his color. He just changed his costume and they treated him like a human. It shows you the kind of myopia that accompanies the whole premise of apartheid or racial segregation. So through the turban trick and through feigned proximity to whiteness, Rute transformed himself. Because of a turban, he was no longer perceived as a black person and as a threat, but rather as a distinguished guest in the United States. As one editorialist noted, Rute not only showed that racism was unjust and cruel, but also that it was stupid and even silly. In 1906, during the race riots in Atlanta, Walter White, not Walter White from Breaking Bad, but Walter White from the NAACP, um, had his home sort of set on fire. Now he escaped the violence of the day during these race riots only because he was light-skinned. He had blonde hair and blue eyes and people mistook him for white. Later, he joins the NAACP national leadership in 1918 as an assistant secretary. He became secretary in 1931 and served at this post until his death in 1955. He's really one of the you know, standout members of the NAACP at that time. And like Rute, White passed and then made his story public. And he did so for a variety of reasons, but primarily he did so as part of his investigation of lynching. So according to White, the lynchings weren't difficult to inquire into. Mistaking him for a white person, small town folks were just all too happy, you know, who worked at the local newspapers and other agencies and who had the most knowledge about lynching, they were in his words very happy to gabble on ad infinitum. Meaning with the slightest provocation, they were unapparently unable to keep themselves from talking to white and sort of spilling all the beans, so to speak. So White used his ability to pass as White to gain insight information and to develop theories of mob psychology and mob violence. Now, the publicity of this information became essential to the NAACP's campaign against lynching, so it had a political purpose. Perhaps in one of the most memorable cases of racial passing in 1848, Ellen Craft passed as White in order to escape slavery in Macon, Georgia. Ellen disguised herself as a white Southern man while her husband, William, pretended to be her dutiful servant. William cut Ellen's hair short and she wore a pair of men's trousers, accessorized with green spectacles and a top hat. So she had quite an elaborate costume. She donned a cast so that she wouldn't be expected to sign any papers because at that time as an enslaved person, she wasn't literate. So she had to sort of hide that to be able to pass. Ellen also wrapped her faces in bandages, which gave her less of a reason to talk to other people. So then during their escape, they make their way to Philadelphia, they travel in first class trains, they dine with the steamboat captain, and they stay in the very best hotels. And then upon arriving in Philadelphia, the crafts work with abolitionists such as William Lloyd Garrison and William Wells Brown to tell their harrowing story of escape. Their story became a very important part of the abolitionist movement. So we see in lots of cases that people are using their passing and their stories of passing as a way to make a political statement. Now, while some of these cases that I've discussed so far of racial passing are temporary, some are lifelong. After passing daily for work, Stella chooses to permanently pass as white. She packed a bag and left a note for her sister saying, sorry, honey, but I've got to go in my own way. And she sneaks out of the apartment while her sister Desiree was at work. She eventually marries her boss, a white man, and assumes a life of a white woman, both at work and at home. The main character in Langston Hughes' story passing suggests that long-term passing is one way of avoiding the emotional costs of transitioning daily and the increased costs of being caught. So as detailed in RJ Smith's pathbreaking biography, John Red, a musical entertainer, also decided to permanently pass as the famous South Asian organist, Korla Pundit. This took some thought and some skill. So he preferred not to inadequately, inadequately mimic an Indian accent. And so he developed an act where he said nothing at all, playing on the stereotype of men from the East as mysterious. Um, he wore a turban to emphasize his foreign quality, something that was also enticing to a Hollywood audience. 
And then leaning even more into these stereotypes, Red placed a jewel in the center of his turban, which appeared almost like a third eye. He said that it had a protective force and it gave him the ability to see into those around him. And he grew his hair to his shoulders knowing that if the turban was ever snatched off, his beautiful long hair would appear. So like Rute, Pundit was attempting to make a political statement through his passing. Smith suggests that Smith, his biographer suggests that Red chose the name Pundit purposefully as a way to communicate a message of freedom and justice to other black Americans. Many black Americans were inspired by the Indian fight for racial equality against British imperialists. One well-known supporter of Indian human rights was Madame Vijaya Lakshmi Pundit. And after Rute, the turban trick was well-known among many black Americans as a way to avoid racial prejudice and maltreatment. So Rute and Pundit had passed successfully and so could others. That's kind of the message that's being communicated. So, Moving on to the section now, for those who are looking at the handout, the ethics of racial passing, one might wonder, what do we learn from these examples? As these cases of racial passing also make clear, passing as white takes great skill. It requires deception at the highest level. One has to be exceptionally good at fooling people, especially white people, in order to pass as white. And this is especially true if you have to keep up the ruse for a lifetime. So the consequences of being caught for passing were severe. A failed attempt could result in jail time, a beating, or even being lynched. So this suggests that fooling of this kind requires a lot of skill. As we can see, all of those who passed found creative ways of keeping up the deception. They used skills they already had available to them. Ellen used her sewing abilities to produce a very elaborate costume. Pundit used his organ playing skills and his flair for drama to entertain people things he'd been doing since he was a child. They also developed new skills, such as speaking with an accent, a Swedish accent in one case, or tying a turban. Pundit, a pioneer of the Hammond organ, managed to develop a distinctly new form of music, what would later be known as exotica. A friend described Pundit as much more creative than any other organist he'd ever heard. He said that Corla created chords and harmonics that would, should be called purple chords that were just rich and deep and beautiful. Stella learns to overcome her sense of nervousness and to keep her hands still when she's sitting at work or around white people more generally. And as the main character in Langston Hughes' story, Passing Notes, he learns to go his, his natural instinct to say hello to his mother when he passes her on the street, painfully, painful as it is to do so. Now, these are all different types of skills. In particular, people are developing skills of creativity, um, of performance and drama, but also develop skills of self-control. It takes a lot of control to kind of fight off the nervousness that you might feel when you're passing as white, when the cost of, of being found out is so high. Um, in, in Langston Hughes's story, it's a particularly painful moment when the main character, who's unnamed, talks about the fact that he walks by his mother and he can't say hi to her. And he actually has to fight this instinct. So he has to develop the skill of self-control as part of his um, ability to pass as white. Most notably, passing as white also requires cultivating knowledge of how to be white, learning how to act the way that white folks do in public and in private spaces. So Stella already knew how to work hard and well, but according to her own description, knowing how to be white meant knowing what to wear to fancy cocktail parties, who to become friends with in professional circles, and when to raise one's voice in a neighborhood meeting. It also meant taking on a specific mindset. In part, what Ruby learns through passing is that being white requires being, believing in one's own white innocence and acting as if others will recognize this innocence. So this means thinking and acting as if white people will remain unhindered and unpunished no matter what they do. Stella similarly comes to know that her apparent whiteness means she will be believed over any black person who accuses her of passing. In short, those who can pass as white are exceptionally knowledgeable and skilled. They've cultivated the knowledge and ability needed to navigate white power, to manipulate others, and to redirect racist forces and ideas towards their own just ends. What I want to suggest now then is that racial passing should be considered a politically virtuous use of deceptive skill. In his work on Booker T. Washington, Desmond Juglohan argues that in normal conditions of justice, we value truthfulness and sincerity and condemn deceit. Social trust is almost unthinkable, he says, if people refuse to express what they believe and who they really are. 
Now this might all hold true in a community of social equals, but in the Jim Crow South, when racial segregation was in place, that was far from being the case. In this context, evasion and deceit are actually ways of advancing racial justice and equality. As Frederick Douglass argued, slavery was an inherently cruel practice and it imposed dire costs on those who were and remained enslaved. If Ellen Craft hadn't engaged in deception, she would have remained trapped in slavery, a grave injustice. Had Stella not passed, she would have continued to live under the oppressive systems of Jim Crow for much of her life. In passing, she challenges the very ability of Jim Crow to do what it was created to do, namely ensure racial segregation. When Stella and Pendit, Pundit passed, they not only avoided the lynching that, they, that those they knew suffered, but they also worked towards a realization of equality of opportunity. They gained access to economic opportunities and careers that they would never have had had they not passed as white. And in making their stories public, Kraft, Rute, Pundit, and White skillfully passed as a way to disrupt and challenge racial oppression in its many varieties. So through their creativity, they disrupted notions of white superiority. Pundit demonstrated that Black people could be successful on the main stage if they were just given the chance. Rute showed that white people in the South were easily fooled. The mere change in a hat and an accent was enough to deceive them. White sought to challenge the idea that lynching, a practice essential to white dominance in the American South, was morally permissible. These were all ways of ending racial oppression. So these historical cases of racial passing stand in contrast to cases that have drawn recent attention. Some of you may have heard of this case. Um, Jessica Krug, an associate professor at George Washington University, misrepresented herself as a Black woman. She claimed to have had various Black identities, which she says in her own words, she had no right to claim. First North African Blackness, then US-rooted Blackness, then Caribbean-rooted Bronx Blackness. In doing so, she said that she eschewed her own lived experience as a white Jewish child in suburban Kansas City. As Lauren Michael Jackson claimed in The New Yorker, Krug's life and by extension, her scholarly career had been based on a lie she admitted. In the end, Krug's actions were neither skillful nor just. Krug used her lie primarily for personal gain, to gain access and acclaim within her discipline. And in doing so, she actually contributed to the oppression of black people, especially black women. And I think this is what makes her case one of racial fraud, something morally objectionable, rather than a case of mere racial passing, which can be virtuous. Now, Krug isn't the only one, as we know, who's recently passed as black in academic and activist contexts. Um, like Krug, Satchel Cole, an activist known for racial and social justice advocacy, and C.V. Vitolo, a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, also apologized for lying about being black. This happened soon after Krug's case was sort of brought to light. But I think that Krug's case is probably among the more morally egregious instances of racial fraud. And I think that's perhaps why her case received so much more attention than the others. So let me fill in some of the details here. People had doubts about Krug's racial identity early on. An anonymous junior scholar in Krug's field reported that she'd been following Krug's transformation for a decade. And while she always took Crook at her word, she said, I always had certain misgivings. Eventually, this junior scholar worked with two other senior Afro-Latinx professors who also had their doubts, and they researched Krug's background. They found proof of Krug's racial background in her parents' obituaries. They never planned on making the information public. They planned on confronting Krug personally and asking her to stop lying and to apologize. But before they could do that, Krug got wind of their plans and wrote her own piece and posted it on Medium, admitting the lie. Now, it isn't surprising that Krug's deception wasn't compelling to Afro-Latinx individuals. As Yomaira Figueroa and Vasquez and Yarmar Bonilla aptly argue, over the course of her life, Krug built an identity based on the worst stereotypes, beliefs, and supposed dysfunctions of Black and Latinx people. Now, it's bad enough that she pretended to be Black or Latina. Worse, she portrayed herself as the daughter of addicts battling overdoses and suicide attempts on the streets of the barrio. She claimed to be the only person in her family to go to college, took on characteristic anti-racist stances, and engaged in racist cosplay under the nonsensical name of Jess La Bombalera. If anyone questioned her white appearance, she would retort that her mother was a drug-addicted sex worker who her white father had raped. So, like Pundit and Rute, 
Krug played on obvious stereotypes, exaggeratedly displaying characteristics associated with Latinx people in film and on television. Now, while this overemphasis made it harder for white people to doubt her, it is likely why those within the Afro-Latinx community were unconvinced. To white people, these antics would feel familiar, confirming what white people already think about members of the Afro-Latinx community. For those within the community, Krug appeared as if she was trying too hard to be Afro-Latinx, a complex identity with many different nuanced presentations. So in her attempts to prove her authenticity, Krug was reportedly very critical of her Black and Latinx students. And she was also really well known in the field for silencing Black and Latinx activists who didn't seem as woke as her. Um, and she even dedicated her book to her ancestors who bled in Brazil. And at the beginning of an article, she referred to herself as an unrepentant child of the hood. Now, all of these things read to some members of the Latinx community as being over the top. And as we know, right, this is all part of the big lie because she actually had an identity that was you know, not at all connected to these identities that she was um, sort of portraying. So unlike Pundit and Rute, Krug wasn't secretly or publicly communicating a message of justice and freedom to the racially oppressed. And she didn't appeal to these exaggerated stereotypes as a way of challenging racist structures and practices. As a public figure, Krug's actions work to entrench the notion that Black and Latinx people are victims of poverty, violence, and, and as such, lacking an agency. These are the very ideas that underwrite and support racial, um, racial oppression. So it's hard to know what motivated Krug to pass as Black. As mentioned earlier, um, traditionally, there have been very few benefits um, associated with this type of reverse passing. Um, because traditionally, you know, if there wasn't a benefit to be uh, for a white person to pass as black, it might just put you at risk um, economically, but also perhaps physically. So there wasn't a long tradition of this happening. But recently things have changed, especially in academia. There have been some small steps that have been taken to address inequalities in representation, both at the faculty level, but also in professional publications and at conferences. In some circles, when discussions of blackness occur, there is now, as there should be, a greater emphasis placed on including those with lived experiences of blackness. This is one way of ensuring that the voices of black people are heard and prioritized within academic discussions of blackness. Now, whether she meant to or not, Krug took advantage of this recent shift and personally benefited from it. Now, how did she manage to do this? Well, she did so by feigning proximity to whiteness. Krug passed, at least among other white people, as a light-skinned Afro-Latina. And as Karen Atia argues, biracial and light-skinned women have always been given more access, power, and visibility than darker-skinned women. Vanessa Rochelle Lewis notes that Krug received accolades, professional opportunities, publishing opportunities, awards, community love and adoration, and financial resources that so many darker-skinned Black women writers and academics are struggling for and fighting to access. How many darker skinned women were passed over in favor of Krug and this set on opportunities in both activist and academic contexts? Now, the worst part is that Krug didn't even need to pass as black to successfully do the work she does. Even with the recent emphasis placed on including black voices, there are and will always be many white and non-black scholars of race. I'm a non-black scholar of race. Um, but Kig's Krug's perceived proximity to whiteness merely allowed her to take up some of the opportunities that could and should have gone to black women. So Krug's racial deception not only benefited her, a white woman, but it also served to further exclude black women, especially darker skinned black women from activist and academic circles. And in this way, it served to further entrench inequality of opportunity in education, jobs and income for these women. Now, does this mean that whenever white people pass as black, it's a case of racial fraud, a morally objectionable form of racial misrepresentation? After all, one might argue that there seems to be cases of white people skillfully passing as black and for the sake of racial justice. For example, in the early 60s, um, and some of you may know this person, John Howard Griffin, a novelist and a white native of Dallas, Texas, took a six-week journey on the bus through racially segregated states such as Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Now, Griffin, a white man, darkened his skin so that he could pass as Black during his travels. He took a large oral dose of an anti-vitiligo drug and spent up to 15 hours a day under an ultraviolet lamp. 
During his travels, he was chased down the street by a white man shouting racial epithets. He was told that he was waiting in the wrong room and had to move to the Blacks only room. And in one instance, when Griffin was at a park, he was approached by a white man and told politely to leave, despite the fact that the park was not segregated. Now, Griffin said that his experiences helped him to better understand what it was like to be Black and to be wronged by racism. Griffin wrote and published the book, Black Like Me, which was a detailed narrative of his experiences. And he said that he did so with the hope of enlightening white people about what it was like to live under Jim Crow and moving them to take action to end racial segregation in the American South. Later in 1968, Grace Housel did something similar. Inspired by Griffin, she also took pills to darken her skin and pass as black while she traveled and worked in Harlem and Mississippi. She wrote about her experiences in her book, Soul Sister. Like Griffin, she said she hoped her book would help white people to understand what it was like to be black. The book received critical acclaim and sold more than a million copies. In fact, Lyndon Johnson even provided a blurb for the book. Now, are these cases of racial fraud or mere racial passing? If we take them at their own word, Griffin and Housel misrepresented themselves as a way of challenging racial injustice. And they also seem to do so skillfully. Housel and Griffin created elaborate costumes would allow, which allowed them to successfully pass as black over the long term among black and white people. Yet given how entrenched white supremacy and racial prejudice are, it's really hard to imagine that these cases aren't objectionable in some sense. Now, while I think these cases were complicated, they had many, many motives and aims were likely at play, it's clear that the desire for personal gain, the desire for acclaim and accolade was pr a primary motivation for the decision to pass. If it isn't or wasn't, why wouldn't Griffin and Housel simply have used their voices and platforms to elevate the testimony of Black people and Black journalists about life in the Jim Crow South? Because at that time, like Black men and women were already writing about their own experiences. It would have been easy enough for Griffin and Housel to connect with some of them. In fact, in if their goal was really genuinely to promote racial justice and end racial oppression, then promoting Black voices was likely the most compelling route. Doing so would have served the double goal of making Black voices heard while also bringing about greater awareness of racial segregation. It also would have led to more accurate depictions of Black Americans in their lives. So in centering their own voices and experiences, Housel and Griffin satisfied the desire for personal gain. And acting for our own personal gain isn't wrong in and of itself, but it can have bad consequences. In this case, Housel and Griffin contributed to the ongoing and false stereotypes of Black people as victims, as lacking the agency and intelligence to need to effectively advocate for themselves. Even the content of their own books contributed to this narrative. As Robin D.G. Kelly suggests, despite collecting taped interviews with Black people who were joyful and funny, who spoke of the goods of Black community, Housel chose to focus on Black suffering and Black pain rather than Black life and all of its complexity. And in his diaries, Griffin pathologized Black male sexuality, worrying that he would not be able to fully return to whiteness and terrified that his wife would soon be sleeping with a Black man. In the end, it simply may not be possible for a white person to pass as Black without it being racial fraud. That is a morally objectionable form of mis racial misrepresentation. Now, in some sense, Jessica Krug's case is uncomplicated. It's obvious that her racial misrepresentation was more vicious than it was virtuous. And ultimately, even do-gooders such as Griffin and Housel also seem to do something wrong in misrepresenting themselves. But these are all cases of white people misrepresenting themselves as Black. And we might wonder, are there any cases where it's unethical for Black or Brown people to misrepresent themselves as white? So I think at this point, in light of everything we've discussed, it's really worth tur turning back to the case that we started with, namely the case of Stella in The Vanishing Half. Because I think that this is a kind of a complicated case of uh, mis racial misrepresentation, because in deciding to misrepresent herself, she leaves her twin sister Desiree behind, which means that she leaves Desiree alone to face the very oppressive conditions that she herself, uh, meaning Stella herself, is trying to escape. And she also leaves Desiree to take care of her ailing mother on her own. And we know from the book that Desiree is deeply hurt by Stella's departure and never fully overcomes the loss of that relationship. 
Now, of course, Desiree doesn't deserve to be hurt this way. She's a good person. She works hard. She takes care of her mother and her daughter, and she does so well. And more than that, she saved Stella's life when it was threatened by the white mob who had come after her father. Desiree is also the one that encouraged Stella after she was fired to apply for that job at the department store in the first place. And remember, that's the job that starts the whole story of passing. So this is all to say that Desiree took excellent care of Stella. And Stella knows all of this, which is why um, she apologizes for leaving and begs for forgiveness when she finally sees Desiree again after many years. But to me, you know, even her apology really didn't make up for the harm that she caused because Stella's really only there to ask Desiree to save her again. So years after her departure, um, when she's living on the West Coast, Stella is confronted by Desiree's daughter, Jude. And Jude knows Stella's true identity. So Stella is worried that Jude is going to expose her. So she returns home to Mallard in Georgia to convince Desiree to get Jude to stop. And that's when she finally apologizes to Desiree for abandoning her. Her apology is in part motivated by her desire to maintain her ruse, to maintain her life as it is. And so that's why her apology in the end doesn't feel very satisfying. Now, even if regrettable, the harm to Desiree that might not initially be kind of excusable might be justifiable, all things considered, if Stella didn't truly have any other options available to her. She would be in what is classically referred to as a double bind or a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. As Marilyn Fry argues, one of the most characteristic and ubiquitous feelings of features of the world as experienced by oppressed people is a double bind. Those are situations in which options are reduced to a very few, and all of them expose one to penalty, censure, or deprivation. So Stella's damned if she doesn't misrepresent herself as white because she'll be stuck in an oppressive and unjust situation because she's living during the time of racial segregation in the American South. She is damned if she does because she hurts and must leave behind someone she deeply loves, namely her twin sister, but also her mother. Now, Stella is faced with limited options and all of them are far from ideal. That's what it is to be um, in a double bind. All the options are far from ideal and they're all costly in different ways. So you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. And none of them seem, I mean, seem to be entirely right or morally justified. Now that's a feature, not a bug of the situation or the context of a double bind. Because a double bind is constructed so that it makes it difficult for people to escape oppression. That's actually how the double bind works to reinforce oppression. So if it's true and Stella is in a double bind, we might think that she made the best of a bad situation. We might then forgive or excuse her for hurting Desiree. But we might ask ourselves, is Stella right to think that the only way to save herself and challenge racial oppression is by misrepresenting herself as white? Is she really in a double bind? So again, thinking that, you know, maybe she didn't do the right thing when she left Desiree behind, but maybe she was in this, this double bind situation and what she did was excusable. But the question then for us is like, is she really in a double bind? Well, I think we have to take a look at Desiree because I think that she actually presents us with an alternative path. So unlike Stella, she doesn't misrepresent herself. She spends most of her life living in Mallard, Georgia as a black woman, even when it's really hard to do so, especially as a single mother. But her story is largely one of success and, and joy, I would say. Jude, her daughter goes to UCLA on an athletic scholarship and begins a new life that's full of opportunity. By the end of the book, Desiree is also considering going to college and pursuing her true career interests, suggesting that she too is going to have her own opportunities. Now, this suggests that Stella may have had another option available to her, the option that Desiree chose, but it requires a lot of patience. Desiree has to wait much of her life. She has to wait for her daughter to grow up. She has to wait for her ailing mother to pass away before she can even think about going to college and focusing on herself and her true desires. So whether Stella is justified in her decision to misrepresent herself may depend on whether we think she must patiently wait for justice in the way that Desiree did, or whether she's morally permitted to make her escape and to free herself from her oppressive situation by racially misrepresenting herself. It may also depend on what we think about Desiree's life as she waits for her time to come, 
Even under those oppressive conditions, in many, many ways, Desiree lived a life on her own terms. She had deep relationships of care, not only with her daughter, Jude, but also with her mother, Adele, and her husband, Early. It's worth noting that unlike Stella, who marries her white boss, Desiree marries a dark-skinned Black man who she meets in Mallard. Now, these relationships, particularly relationships with other Black people, gave meaning and value to Desiree's life. She's an agent active in her own life and not merely a victim of racial oppression. And she is also, for the most part, happy and satisfied with the life that she's able to carve out. And we know that she's able in the end to start carving out opportunities, not only for herself, but her daughter. So I think in her own way, she finds a way to challenge and upend the oppressive conditions of her life. So one wonders in the end, who really has the better life and who really is more virtuous, Stella or Desiree? Was Stella really in a double bind? Did Stella have another option? Could she have done what Desiree did? Um, and then that leaves us wondering, did Stella really do the right thing? And in turn, were her actions genuinely virtuous? I think one of the most amazing things about The Vanishing Half is that these are the very questions that the book and the author, Britt Bennett, leave us with. And so I too will end here. And I hope that we will talk more about these complicated cases as the night continues. Thank you so much for listening. Oh, here we go. Thank you, Mina. That was, uh, yeah, uh, indeed, very difficult cases to, to judge. Like, it's, uh, it's hard to tell, really. Um, yeah. So uh, we are uh, going to have the Q&A session now. So as I said earlier, so if you have questions, uh, we are asking you to type them in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we're going to then uh, pass the question to Mina. Sorry, I'm just trying to navigate my box. As you <laughs> Too many going on. We don't have questions yet, but uh, I'm gonna maybe attempt one. So in the in the very difficult situation that you ended with, uh, where we have Desiree who chooses to still live the uh, a black life and uh, Stella who decides to to take a different path. Um, if Stella still, so maybe there was a more virtuous choice ahead of her or in front of her, but if uh, if she still like did some good or still kind of unable to uh, uh, to work toward uh, overcoming or at least like fighting for uh, for uh, racial justice or things like that. So isn't there still a bit of virtue in what she did, even if it was not the most virtuous? So, and in this case, are we still thinking of it in terms of fraud or not? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I mean, I think it, like philosophy, sometimes we just have views that some things are mixed actions, like it could be partially virtuous and partially vicious. Um, I think it's hard because I think the book in a way raises these questions because there's so much pain caused for Desiree, her mother, that are left behind, ultimately for the, both of the daughters, both Stella and Desiree have daughters who find out about this past, um, and Stella herself grapples like with the pain of leaving, and I think Britt Bennett is really asking us like, is this really virtuous? Like we can see like why she might do it. We understand some of the reasons, but given how many bad things happened, um, is it really worth it? Especially because Desiree seems to accomplish even more than Stella does by staying, right? And, and being within her community. So I think, you know, one of the things that comes out of, of the book really is this idea of the goods of black community and how enriching and important that is, but also that it gives you the resources you need to actually deeply challenge um, racial oppression. Um, because it's, you know, it gives you the resources, but you're also able to generationally, you know, work with your children in broader communities. There's a way of maybe uplift that you can uplift more people if you're working within your own community. Um, so I think it really does raise this question about, I mean, for me, I really grapple with it. So I don't have an answer, which is kind of why I ended the talk where it is, because I think these cases are very, very difficult. Good. Thanks. Okay, so we, we have some questions that came in. So the first one from Tracy. And so Tracy says, uh, in case like the vanishing half, uh, 
is it the deception and hurt that makes it wrong or is it something about the choice itself to pass so if the former then i wonder if the structural analysis falls out of your analysis when you deny her a double bind okay i'm going to just think about this for one second yeah it's a, <laughs> i can repeat if you want <laughs> yeah you should be okay, able that to see great. that one in the so eventually we kind of the thread becomes long and we we lose them but that's the first okay. one on top Right. I can definitely just give it a read. Um, yeah. So I guess one, the first part of the question is, you know, what is it that makes um, makes it wrong to maybe perhaps pass in the first place? Is it the choice itself or is it is it something else? Um, is it something structural? I, I really grappled with this question because in a way, I think part of the thought is that, well, first of all, the personal and the political are just so complicated. Um, in the sense that the only way that Stella can actually move uh, to the West, you know, and escape some of these oppressive conditions is by making a personal choice to, to sort of disrupt her family. And double binds are such that they are social political structures, but then they shape our personal choices. Um, I think that's always the way that double binds work. So I think in part what's sort of making, making it wrong is the personal choice. And maybe what mitigates some of the wrongness is that it's happening within these structural conditions. Um, but the question that Stella versus Desiree raises for me is like, is her personal choice really as forced as it initially seems? And we don't really get that conversation until the end, which I think is part of the brilliance of the book, that you get this slow narrative about Desiree's um, story developing and her as an individual developing and her daughter. Um, and it then raises this question of like, oh my God, like it did what Stella do make sense? Was that actually the right thing to do? Maybe not. Um, because there are maybe some other personal choices that she could have made, even within those very oppressive structures that might have served the same political end. Yeah, thank you. So the next question from Susie. So uh, Susie says, I know this doesn't address many of the issues with racial fraud you brought up, but I'm wondering how the existence of testimonial injustice intersects with these cases. So specifically, could passing as Black potentially aid in the fight for racial justice by piggybacking on the extra credence given to the white authors? I take it that is one of the things that uh, Griffin, like the author of Black Like Me, did think. He thought that, look, who's most likely to persuade um, white people? Well, a white author who somehow manages to get lived experience as a Black person. Um, so I do think you're right that this... Um, like you could, I think you're right, they could add extra credence for sure. Um, the other part of the question was like testimonial injustice, right? I'm just trying to think. Um, well, I guess what I wanted to say about this case is that part of the problem with this is epistemic because some of the set of beliefs that they're conveying, even if they're given higher credence, are false beliefs right, that Black life is all pain, it's all suffering, it's all oppression. And one of the biggest things about both of these books is like they really paint such a dark, unhappy picture of Black life, which is also patently false, especially given the testimony that both of them collected, especially in Grace Halso's case, you have the audio tapes. Um, so Robin D.G. Kelly is actually writing a book on Halso, working through the archives is my understanding. And so he's sort of saying, I listen to these tapes and they're these Black women being funny and like joyful and talking about their love of other Black people and Black community, and all of that's missed. So on one hand, you're right, I think there would be extra credence given to the, to, to the testimony of these white authors, but then it leads to false beliefs because their own white bias or white ignorance, to speak of Charles Mills, is blocking them from sort of seeing the truth, right, and painting an accurate um, picture. Yeah, I'm not familiar with those work, but so when they were writing, they are, was it uh, like, uh, did they say that they were, uh, that they experienced like uh, for a little while uh, what it is to be black and then they were like openly saying like, I'm white, but here's my experience and so on. Yeah, so that was, okay, sure. Yeah, so they just like, yeah, they basically once they wrote the book were like, hey, I was a white person and I did these things to make myself dark skin and I passed for six weeks. Here's my story, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so there was still this perspective right in. Um, so the next question, very short. Uh, so uh, Stephen wants to know whether you're working on a book on passing. I mean, I've been writing, I've written a few public pieces on racial passing. I wrote about Dolezal when that case was big. And I have another piece, piece that I'm kind of working on. So maybe one day, um, it's like sort of on the, it's on the, it's on the back burner, but I, I will think about it. <laughs> but thanks for the question. Yeah, I don't know is the answer right now. Yeah. I mean, clearly all those cases that you talked about, like you could put this all together in a, a very good book, I'm sure. Yeah. 
so Jenny is the next person who wrote a question for us. So thank you very much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I was wondering if you think that the ethical framework that you described extends to folk who hold more complicated conceptions of race, and so don't so much view themselves as, as passing, but instead as occupying an uncommon conception of racial identity, or view themselves radically uh, misidentified. Identified. So the potential virtue shifts from something like justice to something like authenticity. Yeah, I think I don't fully understand this question. So I would love if maybe Janine would write a follow up because I think I don't know what we mean um, with this idea of compl more complicated conceptions of race um, about as occupying an uncommon conception of identity or see, you know, seeing themselves as misidentified. I need more clarification on that question. Unfortunately, we can't have a bit of a back and forth. So I, I don't quite know how to okay. answer that question. <laughs> Okay, Janine, if you want to write a bit of clarification, maybe we'll come back to your question. That would be great. <laughs> okay. So the next one uh, from, uh, sorry if I mispronounce your name, uh, Usama. Uh, so Usama wants to know, uh, what about vicious forms of racial passing or fraud, like white passing people pretending to be indigenous to Canada or Middle East or Han Chinese who claim uh, to, sorry, Uyghur, belong to uh, to their ethnic group so ras racial passing as like neo-colonialism yeah i've definitely been thinking about this idea that um in one case when i'm talking about racial fraud um it is a kind of occupation right a kind of claiming of space that doesn't properly belong to one group of people and so there does feel like a kind of neo-colonial aspect. Um, I think I think that's a good way of putting it. I have been thinking about that, of, of kind of thinking about how this ties in with colonialism. So maybe we don't make ter territorial land grabs in the same way that we do, but colonialism is about grabbing resources. And if we think about Krug's case, for example, um, she's grabbing resources just as the colonists did, right? So I think, you know, there is a kind of neo-colonial aspect that, you know, there's white people kind of claiming access to resources that aren't properly theirs. Um, this is especially important because we are finally in academia making some steps towards actively trying to include people of color in spaces that they should obviously have a seat at the table. And just as this is happening, you see people like Krug and Dolezal in academic spaces start claiming an identity that they don't belong to. And part of that's because it's an attempted resource grab. Um, and so in that way, I think that's, I think, you know, Osama's totally right to think that there's a kind of neo-colonial aspect. I think he's, oh, or they are also right that they can happen in other cases, thinking about um, Middle Eastern or North African or Han Chinese um, claiming Uyghur identities. I think racial passing can um, happen. I mean, these are more like ethnicities. So we'd have to think about if there are differences with cases of ethnicities, but I do think there are lots of cases of passing that can happen among different races. Um, and they may also similarly be linked with histories of colonialism. Yeah, there's the th this thing about the passing, like when the black passed for white versus and the other way around. There's the, the history of, uh, of the relationship between those cultures that upfront makes it makes one more uh, dubious than the other. Yeah. Uh, so the next question from Natasha. Uh, so are there discussions in Canadian academia on racial passing for scholars and or students who identify as indigenous? There has been yeah. much coverage of such cases for authors and filmmakers. That's a good question, because I think there's been a lot of public discussion and being at Queens, many of you will know there's been a big discussion about who can claim indigenous identity. Um, I think right now there's a growing academic discussion. I don't think from my knowledge that it's there yet. And part of this is that Identities, indigenous identities are kind of made, perhaps, I say this very tentatively, but nation specific. And I actually think it's very difficult to give a general account of what counts as authentic indigenous identity because it's gonna depend on the people and the nation and their own views about what is required for membership within their nation. So my own view is that actually there's a good reason that we don't see some generalized accounts talking about indigenous identity um, is because it's very difficult to give a generalized theory and that should be left to indigenous people to determine on their own. And I think 
think as academics, um, you know, we're trying to stand back from that. In the case of black to white passing, there's actually a huge literature um, on this, both in fiction and nonfiction. Um, and that might just be because a lot of this discussion is coming from the United States and is thinking in particular about blackness as it occurs in the United States. So there are differences between race and ethnicity. I don't think we should think of indigenous identity working in the way that blackness might work. I think these are potentially different concepts. And so they won't, I don't know that this discussion that I've had today translates in any way to discussions about indigenous identity. Um, and I leave that to scholars who know more about those topics to, to kind of discuss. But thank you, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think we have a follow up uh, from Janine. So, uh, or is it that follow up? Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that was the same, Jenny. Uh, so, uh, Jenny says, uh, I was unfamiliar with your work on uh, the Dolezan. So, that is kind of, that is a kind of case that I might be thinking of. So, if we entertain her reports of her identity. So, but I was thinking of folks who believe that they are constructed as some other uh, racial group by some combination of their experience and the internal constructions of their phenomenal selves. Well, I think the Dolezal case is complicated and I don't know, I think you and I are speaking in somewhat different terms, so I'll try to do my best to answer in a way that makes sense. But like Dolezal, look, no one's denying that race is socially constructed. I think all of us are kind of on the same page, but does that then mean anything goes? Like just because you feel black today, does that mean that you're black? No, clearly not. And in my own work on uh, Dolezal, I've kind of argued that when we're at least in the political context talking about race, we need to kind of look at a genealogical account of race and genealogy matters. Meaning once we found out that Dolezal's parents were had, you know, Northern or like Western European ancestry, everybody's like, oh, okay, so she's white. Right? because we think that genealogy matters and it matters for political reasons, right? Um, in the sense that in the United States, for example, if we were talking about affirmative action or reparations, we wouldn't think that Rachel Dolezal, just because she knows how to do box braids and um, you know, self-identifies, like sees her as a part of a black community is now entitled to affirmative action or uh, reparations if there was reparations. So even if she experiences herself you know, as black, because she sees herself as participating in a black community. She says that she's married um, to a black man. She has black children. Um, and she knows, you know, again, she talks about how she's, you know, she's very committed to black culture as an aesthetic um, and, you know, and, and maybe other things. But I think for many of us, we don't actually think that she's black despite those things. She's a white woman who loves black culture. I mean, that's the way I would cash that out. And again, because I think um, Dolezal in an institutional setting, namely the university where she's claiming on the basis of her identity, she was claiming a right to resources, scholarships, funding, um, positions in a historically black college. Those are all things that are, in, that's an institutional claim that she's making in that context. I don't think, frankly, um, that, that, that she would be entitled to claim a black identity and then claim resources on the basis of that identity. And this goes back to Osama's point about claiming resources and the kind of colonial kind of tendency that's wrapped up with that kind of claim. I hope that helps. And thanks for the follow-up. Uh, so the next question from Jess. I was wondering what you might think of racial passing, specifically passing as Black person, when there's no intention to gain something from doing so, but one simply identify as a Black person, if there's such a thing. <laughs> there might be. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, like, I mean, it's hard to know because it's hard for me to imagine. For me, it's also just about the political context, like, at least in this um, paper, I didn't really talk a lot about the politics of, of race and race claims. Um, but it sort of depends. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I have to think of a case where, like, where that would make sense. And I'd have to look at the details. I think of anything we get from the richness of Stella's cases, a lot of the ethics of these cases hangs on the details. And that's why I point to the details of Rachel Dolezal. It isn't just that she's claiming like blackness. It's like that she was making claims to certain kinds of entitlements and resources. So I think for me, this, like that kind of a case is just like so abstract. I don't really know how to adjudicate it. We'd really have to look at some cases and some details and look at what the consequences and what kinds of claims. Um, 
you know, but if they were like just in their house by themselves, self-identifying as black, maybe your question is like, would that be problematic? I don't know. Again, we'd have to look at the details and the psychology of that. It's just, I'm really sort of like resistant to trying to look at very abstract cases. Um, I'm really trying to give a concrete ethical analysis of cases that have actually happened or that we can, we can kind of tease apart and, and really get the nuanced um, kind of facts kind of at issue and like kind of dissect them. So for me, it's hard mm -hmm. to think about these cases. I see. Okay. So, and do you think maybe just kind of a follow-up then uh, what uh, Jess's question made me think of is that some people uh, are born in a, a male or a female body, but they feel like their gender, they, they feel like the other way around. So you think like for passing, it's not something like that. It's not... Uh, I think that race and gender, function, and gender. Or function differently. They're just different concepts, just like I've seen with ethnicity. Um, they are social concepts and social categories, but I think they fundamentally function differently. I really think that race is a genealogical or generational yeah. concept, something that passes through a historical legacy related to institutions, um, but also dissent as it's linked with certain institutional practices. And so for me, um, these two things are different. And so I think we can say that the, the trans case in the case of gender you know, makes sense. Yes. And then we can also say that maybe in the case, at least as the world is right now, when it regards race, cases like Rachel Dolezal don't make sense. Mm. Um, and I just think these concepts function differently. Yeah. People disagree with that, though. Um, you know, for example, I believe Lewis Gordon is publishing a piece, probably already published, arguing that actually they're the same and that transracial identity is something that's morally justified or permissible. So people have different views about these things. Okay. I never thought that they were quite the same for me, like context matters so much, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so the next question from uh, Rina, is the distinction between racial passing and racial fraud to be characterized by intention or collateral impacts on prevailing stereotypes? Yeah, I think the cases that I've kind of talked about in, in this piece particularly are looking at more of the kind of, the kind of consequences like the impact. And I've sort of suggested, I mean, like, in, you know, that there may be a link, there's a little bit of a link, right? Because I kind of say, look, um, you know, with Grace Halsell and, and, and Griffin, um, they're really motivated by personal gain and that kind of taints their ability to give us like the real facts of the situation because they want to center themselves and their own voices. And so in some sense, like those intentions then have these bad consequences. So I guess in a way, ultimately I'm kind of, at least in this talk, I'm concerned with consequences, but I don't think those are set in some ways. I think they could sometimes be the result of bad intentions, um, but it, it is the consequences in this case that I'm probably most worried about. So that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, so the next question from Mike, who thanks you for the talk, and he says, uh, you mentioned other junior scholars being skeptical of Krug's claim while still differing to her. This seems like the correct approach to such situations, but I'm curious if you think if more or less skepticism is appropriate and what factors may be relevant here. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I think, yeah, I do think that deference is a, probably the right attitude to take, or at least a kind of... Um, agnosticism maybe even like I don't you know and I think a lot of people for a long time are like I have these doubts but I don't really know and we're very 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 careful about it and remember that in the case of Krug the people who found her out were not going to take this public they were basically going to sort of ask behind closed doors for her to stop doing what she was doing and maybe to apologize to people who were affected um, but they weren't going to like expose her it was actually her own piece right that she published first that exposed her sort of nationally um, so I think it's right that like, you know, that, that people have an attitude of, I don't really know, because it's really hard to know. And we know because of racial passing that we are not necessarily the best at identifying. I think what's interesting to me is that insiders in the community often do somehow have a radar about these things. So it's not surprising to me that many, many people for the last decade had doubts about Krug and her racial identity. Um, the truth, the, tr the same thing was true about Dolezal as well, actually. So many people had doubts, but people didn't want to ask, right, because we're worried about being wrong. And so I think we should tread, tread, tread lightly. Um, but it also then in the case of the university and politics more generally, we do have to sometimes answer these questions of who counts as having a particular identity, especially if we're giving out resources. So we are gonna have to have some answers to questions about race and ethnicity and who counts. Um, and in those cases, we'll need clear ways of identifying people, especially if people are making claims to resources. But just as students um, and as faculty, like. I think we should definitely be very careful about these these things. Yes. 
So uh, next question from Tracy. Uh, so what would you say about people who are not trying to pass, but who are often taken to be, for example, white and feel burdened by always having to clarify their identity? So if they do not clarify, are they passing or is there something else going on? A good question. Yeah, that's a great question. I guess my own view is that they are passing um, because I think whenever we're mis or, so, or there's some kind of misrepresentation going on, is it morally problematic? No, I don't think that you know you have to always expose yourself. Um, like so, that, that's a good question, and maybe there maybe maybe there's another phenomenon for that because it's almost being misidentified or something. I'm not sure what's going on in that case. Um, I think Tracy for that question. So I think in my own little biography for this talk, I said that my daughter is uh, someone who passes as white. I mean, that's less the case now as she's getting older, but um, we have had this conversation at home. Like, does she need to sort of say like, oh, I'm actually mixed race or something like that as a way of identifying? I don't think that, um, but is that just a case of passing? Maybe there's a neutral case. We've got passing that's virtuous, fraud that's vicious, Maybe there's a morally neutral kind of case, and I don't know, maybe it's just mistaken identity or something like that. There's a third category. So I think I just need like a term for, for what that might be. So I think that's a great, a great case to think more about. So thank you for that. Yeah, and people who, who might be just in these kind of vague situation where it's not clear. I, I, I could see that they, they do feel the burden of having to always clarify if we, if we put importance on this aspect anyway yeah so that was a good question um so next question from um uh, from chris mo no sorry so uh he says or she said sorry they <laughs> i'm not sure so as you identified uh in the crook case there are steps being taken in institutions to increase opportunity opportunities to include more diverse voices in discussions and decision making uh, as should happen. So, however, I cannot help but think that many of these opportunities that are being loaded to benefit all racialized people end up benefiting those who already have greatest access and proximity to resources already, regardless of race. So, Krug did use this racial passing to access additional opportunities in academic uh, and activities in space, but arguably she wouldn't have been able to access these space in the first place if not for her whiteness that afforded her to gain political and economic power in the first place. So can you discuss this uh, interplay between racial passing and class and social status? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of different like parts going on to this question. So part of it sort of saying, look, in some ways, I mean, you're asking questions about kinds of policies of affirmative action and formal and informal policies, perhaps, um, and whether those are really benefiting people who need them, what especially about those who might be um, sitting, you know, in, in lower SES groups. So I think one thing is like, those are really kind of distinct and big questions about what we should prioritize when we're um, uh, distributing resources at the societal level, at the university level, et cetera. Like those are really, really big questions about how we talk about those things. So in some ways, you know, in some ways that just isn't what this talk is about, right? Um, and I think those are, you know, there are lots of big discussions to have about those important questions. But one of the things I do want to say is that, you know, part of what Krug does is making use of a kind of, you're right, a kind of middle class, light, per perceivably light skinned uh, person of color, right? Like that's kind of what she um, is kind of getting these advantages on the basis of. And um, I mean, the point is in some ways she's actually really benefiting from those things that are primarily targeted to people of color, but she's doing it in a way where she's doing it as a light-skinned person. So even when you're trying to um, distribute benefits to people of color, we have to recognize that there are inequalities among people of color. Um, so, you know, light-skinned people have more privilege than dark-skinned. Uh, East Asians might have more privilege, or, you know, perhaps um, than Black Americans. So like something like this. And there's, so they're just different hierarchies of privilege, even among people of color. And it sort of suggest that, that, that you know, they, they can be kind of taken advantage of by, in the wrong way by the wrong people. And in many ways, we need to be more careful about this um, and to think harder about how to make sure we do get the groups that, are, are, that we're trying to get and the ones that we so often ignore. Um, I don't have answers about how to do that, but I think it's a good, very important question to ask. And these cases certainly raise those questions. So a question from Natasha. Uh, it's a question kind of related to what Tracy asked earlier. So. Uh, what do you think about the word uh, white passing for people who look white? So uh, Natasha is biracial. Uh, 
but uh, often perceived as just white. So in mixed space, there has been some discussions about whether the term white passing is appropriate for people perceived as white because the former implies a deliberate attempt to pass, as we have discussed in the, in the other case today. So do you agree or do you think other terms like white perceived or white assumed are more appropriate? Yeah, that's a really good question. I guess I had sort of been thinking about the language of white perceived, um, because you're sort of your identity is being perceived a certain way, even if that's not the way you self identify, or even if that's not the way genealogically your heritage sort of carves out. Um, and so maybe that I like that language, I guess I was sort of, I, I guess I haven't like, this isn't firmly sort of set in stone, but it seems like a nice middle category between passing, which again is virtuous, fraud, which is vicious, maybe there's just this big neutral territory that comes under being misperceived. Um, you know, racially misperceived in, in many different ways and may not be intentional. Again, there's other people perceiving you because a lot of this is we make judgments about people's race based on appearance. And so even when we're not trying, we may be misidentified or misperceived. So I think that I'd want to talk about these people as sort of being racially misperceived rather than merely racially passing. Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> I approve. Uh, so uh, next question, short, but the answer might be long, actually. So could you please apply your analysis to the case of Rachel de, uh, de Lezal? Right. So I think in some ways I've already talked about it in some of the answers to the question so far. And I think a lot of what I'm going to say really just parallels Jessica, what I've said about Jessica Krug. The main difference is that Jessica Krug, so let me just point out some of the differences. Jessica Krug, which she finally talks about it, says, okay, I lied my actual, and she sort of recognizes that the race has a genealogical component. My parents were Jewish, um, you know, perhaps, of, you know, and she sort of says, you know, I grew up in Kansas, suburban Kansas, and I have Jewish identity. So I was lying about having North African and black, et cetera, identity. But Dolazelle is different, right? She says, okay, like, sure, my parents are white, but like, I don't self-identify as white because, you know, again, I'm married to a black man, I have black kids, I engage in black cultural practices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she was, you know, working and, and had gone to an HBCU, um, all of those things. So like, there is a big difference in the sense that their own personal narrative about the story is very different. But for me, that doesn't affect the ethics of, of the case. I mean, maybe, I mean, it depends. If, I mean, I'd be interested to know what other people think. If you think intention matters to the ethics of these cases, um, uh, maybe it does, but for me, I'm really interested in kind of thinking about these, like, I think of Dolezal's case as a pretty clear one, again, that's about making claims to resources on the basis of a genealogy that doesn't belong to her, and that, you know, when we're making these claims, the genealogy that matters is one that tracks a history of political oppression. So I argue that in this short piece that I wrote for Huffington Post, and you can find a link to it on my webpage if you're all interested for my, my analysis of Dolezal, and I do have a longer paper on Dolezal as well um, that's in draft. But that's kind of the thought that that case, like, you know, in some sense, Krug was right about the way she self-described that, you know, I have this genealogy that doesn't entitle me to make these claims. Um, I think that's kind of what Dolezal should have said. And that's what her parents said, but it isn't what she said. Um, so for me, that isn't going to be enough to claim blackness, at least in the political realm or institutional setting. And I think we'd have to have a discussion if there are other contexts where that might be different. Yeah, and it's hard to imagine. Yeah. Um, so uh, next person is Rina. Uh, Rina has two questions. So we're going to start with the first one. So is there a significant distinction between racial fraud and appropriation? I think it would depend on what we mean by appropriation. I mean, yeah. if it's just sort of taking something that doesn't belong to you um, in a way that you're, and, and the fraud part is that you're missing. So the fraud part is really that you're misrepresenting yourself in a way that is unethical or objectionable. And maybe some forms of appropriation could be racial fraud and maybe some forms of racial fraud or appropriation. But part of the, like, the concept for me um, with racial fraud is this idea of misrepresenting yourself. And you might want to argue that these cases are also a kind of appropriation where you're taking something that doesn't belong to you. And that links up with the stuff we've been talking about, the colonial model, et cetera. So um, maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I'd have to think more about that because I'd need to think about what the concept of appropriation really means. Yeah, it sounded that it would uh, apply to cases where you you were you see like neo-colonialism or appropriation of maybe a resource or things like that but yeah i don't know even then yeah i'm not sure i'm <laughs> just thinking out loud maybe i shouldn't do that 
Uh, so the, the other question that Lena had. So what are your thoughts on a visible minority responding to questions like, where are you from? Saying, I'm Canadian. Uh, so could that be interpreted as uh, a form of uh, passing? I mean, race and nationality are two distinct things. So I can be both a, like a brown person who's a Canadian, right? Or a visible minority and a Canadian. And where, you know, I could be having a certain like racial heritage or background or identity and so be Canadian. So for me, these questions, like, I know I don't think that's a kind of passing because one is a claim about, um, you know, just saying I'm Canadian is about your nationality. And I don't think that is like covering for anything because that doesn't say anything about your race. The fact that your Canadian citizen says nothing about your racial heritage. So I don't think that's a kind of passing or misrepresentation. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good point. Yeah. So uh, I don't think we have other questions. So I'm just going to thank you very much, actually, for <laughs> this uh, very uh, interesting talk. Actually, I've learned a lot. Uh, so it's not a topic that I have uh, the occasion to explore much so i think you, you did a wonderful job so thanks a lot and thanks to everyone for uh for participating and for oh, wait, there's up. one more question do we just, we oh, just... Is there okay patrick yeah sure um sorry i have to <laughs> go down and find patrick's question okay so what are your thoughts about racial passing between two different races of color for instance in the case of john reed uh corla pendit so he also plays on South Asian stereotypes to ensure his performance as passing was convincing, like Jessica Kerr did. His motivations also included personal benefit. Do you think this is racial fraud? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of those cases, like, so I, I wanted to think about some of the complicated cases, and I don't ever want to just say personal gain in itself is enough to make a case objectionable. In a way, what I'm more, I'm more concerned with, like, is the consequences. So I think, um, and the way, well, yeah, so maybe, I don't know, maybe intention does matter, because part of it feels like it wasn't his only intention. It was also to do justice. But then we get that with the cases of Grace Halsell and, and Howard, James Howard Griffin as well. But the main difference is like in the kind of consequences of, of, of like their actions. And in one case, it sort of falls flat. But in the pendant case, he's playing on stereotypes, but in a way that actually kind of tries to threaten stereotype and overturn racial um, injustice in certain ways. So I think this is one of those complicated cases Cases that actually needs more analysis. Um, and it relates to some questions before about how much intention really matters. And if consequences are the only thing matters, well, then that's the clear distinction between these cases. But maybe this question is sort of suggesting consequences aren't the only thing that matter. Maybe intentions matter too. Um, and maybe the case with Stella, you know, her intentions are sometimes quite blurry. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good question. I have to think more about it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I will. Thank you. <laughs> so more material for your book. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, again, thank you, Mina. That was wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for participating. And so we're going to do this again with uh, a kind of a panel of speaker next week. Uh, and so we're going to look at um, racialized group and the hesitation to uh, vaccination in the context of this COVID pandemic. So. Great. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks for all the great questions. I really enjoyed talking with everybody. Great. Thanks.